So right, I think we're uh, that's fine. We're good. We're good to go. So um, nearly on time as well. That's all right. Um, we'll put a blog post up uh, about the troubles, which hopefully you've seen, um, and it's got quite a lot of links to uh, things like the. Um, a secret history, sort of, you know, various on the front line type things as well, which we'll talk about um, subsequently. But the, the project I really wanted to start with, Paul, is the, the Instagram project that you did around research of 100 images using the hashtag The Troubles. How did you originally come up with that idea? I think it's probably looking at its, uh, memory. And, and how people share their perspectives and, and certainly the, the origins of the project we're looking at photography I've done a project on photojournalism with Anastasia Venetti and Dan Licker from Bournemouth and they looked at Greek photojournalism and obviously did a lot of photojournalism from the Troubles which I think is very iconic I think we think of the murals particularly uh, the one in Free Dairy Wall for example um, and these are things that have always interested me I think as someone from Northern Ireland who researches it so I think probably the origins were that but also mm. thinking about how is Instagram being used um, to share that for people to not just share their perspective but also these iconic images and also what people think of them, how they comment on it does it generate responses which are personal or very political or both I think we find a bit of both in that. Yeah, because obviously a, a hashtag, most people would know a hashtag is about getting people like up, for example, hashtag Conflict 100 about these events, you know, Newsroom 24 for tonight, you know, people to be able to follow it. So it's almost a way of trending stories and stuff, whereas this is very much around almost like a creating a, a record of something that happened rather than just an event, something that was actually quite a long period of time. So when you think about the breadth of personalities, events, politicians, um, you know, uh, uh, iconic moments, if you like, that have been captured in photojournalism and, and through film. It's uh, It's got such a broad brushstroke, hasn't it? And it's quite interesting. There's some really interesting things that pop up as well. But a lot of it still is up to date as part of the troubles, almost as if it's never ended uh, for a lot of people. But then there's a lot of historical stuff in there. So what was your um, what was your caveat, if you like, for picking the, the hundred images that you selected? It was, it was trickier because a lot of people use hashtags to mean different things, mm. as I'm sure you're well aware, on Instagram, like on Twitter. So for a lot of people, I mean, a different part of the project, if we do more work on it, and certainly that's something I want to do, are people who are doing tours. So they're mm. at Free Dairy Wall, for example, Free Dairy Corner, and they're taking pictures and tagging it with the troubles. So it was sort of going through that, and we were more interested, I think, in looking at the images which were from that time. So mainly photojournalistic work, people like Don McCullen, for example, um, who obviously will be relevant to discussion of Vietnam um, later on in the, the newsroom. How they, those images were being shared, and in many cases, uh, how people were appropriating them who hadn't been there. So I think our kind of starting point was that, and trying to, to narrow it down in terms of looking at those authentic images, if you can call them that, not ones from people who we're in 2019 doing a mm. tour of the mm. peace walls and taking mm. imagery from that. Mm. And I think probably an element of that too is that a lot of these images have other hashtags. So, for example, you'll see a lot of the British Army ones, I'm sure we'll come on to in a minute, are, are tagged as other things. So they're not necessarily just about the troubles. They're also about British soldiers, memorabilia, people who are collectors who mm. are sharing the, their, those images and often their experiences. Because obviously a lot of um, ex uh, multi services personnel do share a lot of imagery in the data set that we find. Um, a lot of images are from people saying, I was there, I was in Cross McLean in 1994, mm. here's me. Mm. Which I think is interesting thinking about memory and how Instagram really is a, a different form of creating and sharing it and also how it can be contested by people. Mm. Mm. So y your criteria really was um, it was authentic from the time that it represented. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So mm. fr from the these are images that, in many cases, um, because of the time period, so going back to the starting points, we collected um, data from August to November, December of last year. So the 50th anniversary of, of key events of the outbreak of, of, of the troubles. Um, a lot of images shared, I think, to mark that. And what we'll come on to, I'm sure, in a second, are, are things like anniversaries of, of very infamous atrocities. Um, mm -hmm. The, the Mountbatten one, for example, came up quite a lot where people were sharing images of that. 
I think, to be fair, in many cases, it was marking the historical event. So it was a case that people were sharing, saying this happened on that day, mm -hmm. not giving an opinion or a caption saying what their view was on that or not. So it was about history, documentation, and yeah, documentary media. I think Instagram is a form of documentary media, which is perhaps more open than mm -hmm. archives or the things that we associate with that, encyclopedias. It is open to anybody who can find that using the search term, using the hashtag. Yeah. So it was really up to the starting point for it. And whatever their route into that is, it's it's personal to them, and that's absolutely okay, isn't it? I guess. I think two 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 points I specifically picked up on um, thinking about it more from our our conversation on Wednesday as well, preparing for this evening was um, the role of international photojournalists in capturing the troubles, as opposed to the British media um, and the way that it viewed or skewed or. Um, um, uh, made quite opaque sometimes uh, things and particularly with denotices de notices what could be reported and what couldn't be reported particularly with anything that happened onto the, on the mainland relating to that so kind of the, the role in photojournalists and how they captured it for people overseas and how it was seen and the other one really was the Mountbatten image um, for me uh, I think I picked up on Wednesday with you wasn't it as well was the fact that I'd never seen that image so quite clearly that, that imagery whether that was captured by local journalists and used locally, international journalists and used internationally, and British journalists, but i never seen it. I'd never seen that image of his body wrapped up being put onto a boat. So again, it's that our remembrance of those times is also dictated by the way that the mainstream media chooses to present it back to us. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly with... Um I mean, Don McCullen comes up quite a lot, you know, again, so yeah, a British journalist in that case, but certainly his, uh, well, looking into it, I'm looking at some of the imagery which are in the data sets which he produced. What's interesting is looking into his background, um, his autobiography is called Is Anybody Taking Notice? Mm -hmm. Which I thought was a great title for a book. Mm -hmm. But he, apparently, again, he speaks about his frustration, the fact that he was witnessing things that were either not being, as he saw it, faithfully recorded by the media, they're either being ignored or overlooked in terms of other images, or they were being censored. And I think certainly in terms of the troubles, there's an awful lot of evidence of how the, the British media, um, I think British mainland media, I just really differentiate that from the, the Northern Irish media uh, in terms of the level of censorship and the level of control in terms of message. Mm -hmm. I think certainly Mountbatten is an example where uh, around that time of 78 79 and there was a lot of focus on trying to reduce the number of propaganda victories for the provisional ira and i think the way that was reported probably reflects that and i think certainly that's a lot of people's experiences was that uh, they probably were getting over here thinking of mainland britain um, to a degree a certain a sanitized version of what was happening i think that there's there was always that issue about hierarchy of victimhood hierarchy of how it was reported, mm. where if it was a British soldier, it was more likely to report it than a civilian, for example, in Northern Ireland. But in atrocity over here, and there, and there were obviously plenty in the 1970s and 1980s, which got a lot of media coverage, would get a lot more coverage, and the imagery used would be a lot more stark, perhaps, as well, thinking of the Birmingham pub bombings, for example. So yeah, I think the censorship's an interesting part to me. I think probably... Um, the idea that the story, you know, the, the story of the image, and I, I think in some cases, when we were talking about this on Wednesday, um, I'm kind of interested in the sort of pop culture elements of it too, mm -hmm. where a lot of these images people might know as an album cover. And there were a couple that we discussed, um, certainly from Killing Joke, um, that people might not have realized where that image came from. Mm -hmm. That it was a Don mm -hmm. McCullen image, that it mm -hmm. was a very iconic image, but mm -hmm. it wasn't well, perhaps well regarded over here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, censorship is an important issue. And I think Instagram maybe gives another outlet hmm. for those images to go somewhere else now, 50 years on. Particularly when you look at the role of the, the mainstream media from an American point of view and how it reports on its uh, foreign adventures, let's put it that way, <laughs> uh, for the sort of <laughs> describing the worthy and the unworthy um, when it comes to you know being reported like, you know, even inventing the term collateral damage as a way of negating 
anyone feeling too sorry about the fact that you know these people are unfortunately killed at this wedding well actually the person you were trying to target were they at the wedding um you know because at least then you'd have some sort of excuse rather than you just got it wrong um and particularly the, the use of drones as well now uh where it's it's perfectly acceptable that we don't even think about any more about how, how these kind of things are targeted so that, that's quite interesting like you said um the final point i want to i want to pick up on in this segment that we're going to film and then we'll carry on talking on facebook live after is a lot of the stuff that comes up in the research that I've done in the last six weeks for the newsroom um, is around the impact of conflict, um, not just war, but sort of conflict in its broadest sense, you know, whether that's sectarian tensions, whether that's, you know, religious tensions, and you know, Sri Lanka, those kind of things, or the Philippines, uh, for example, um, on ordinary civilians, you know, people day to day, that, that trauma now, you might be as a as a, a civilian connected through, say, the RUC or the UDR, or you know your 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 particular uh, family member might be in you know any of the various paramilitary groups and stuff like that. Or you might be a teacher. And it was interesting that the front line series picked out things like you know squaddies on the front line, bus drivers on the front line, um, you know buildings on the front line, that kind of stuff. All that was quite interesting. This 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 view of PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. The impact not on just individuals that are maybe involved directly in that, but also on the population. I mean, do you think it's possible that, you know, Northern Ireland collectively has this kind of post-traumatic stress disorder? But in fact, it's not really gone away, hasn't it? With the mainstream media's lost interest in it because there's been a peace agreement with Bill Clinton. It's obviously OK. Whereas, in fact, a lot of that stuff now comes out in... Um, paramilitary, paramilitary activities like, you know, end the harm that we'll talk about later on um, and sort of punishment beatings and all these kind of things. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to say, I mean, Northern Ireland's a relatively small place in terms of the number of people there and, and against the number of people who would have had a loved one or known someone who died during the conflict. It, and that, that's a very high percentage, I imagine. I think most people who lived through the troubles would have had some interaction with it or some experience of it. I think probably the key part is how, as a society, do you heal those wounds? And I'm thinking, obviously, about tomorrow and some of the things we'll talk about in terms of the former Yugoslavia. You know, we have, you know, there's no simple solution whereby you have a political agreement between politicians from both sides or whatever number of sides there are in a conflict. And those issues go away. I think probably going back to Instagram, you're almost seeing those. It's almost like war by another means. There's often a discussion about you know perhaps the the shooting war and the propaganda war mm. may have finished, but to a large extent the cultural war. And also going back to your point from the first session, it's a very valid one. Um, it, both sides would claim to be victors, and I think and often in conflict, whatever you look at it, um, if there's not an outright winner then who writes the narrative and who owns that narrative is very important. And I think we still have that issue um, 22 years on, nearly after the, the agreement, where to a large extent, whether you're unionist or whether you're nationalist, loyalist or republican, your narrative in the troubles is still shaped by what happened and still shaped by your experience. There aren't agreements on you know, what was the definitive truth or the definitive narrative of what happened. And I think that's probably a long way off, to be honest. I think we've had kind of a a benign apartheid, as somebody you know became very mm, famously mm, called mm, it, mm. where we effectively have a degree of separation in lots of areas where people are content not to perhaps mix with the other community. Mm. Um, and that means they're living in more peaceful conditions. Things are undoubtedly better. Fewer people are being killed. That's obviously a major dividend, but there isn't the reconciliation that perhaps goes to that shared definition of what is effective. Mm. And there's still a debate over what that is. Mm. For a lot of people, I mean, certainly in the unionist community, there would be a lot of people who would balk at the idea that uh, an IRA person who uh, died in a bombing was a victim. You know, there would be still be a, 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 in the nationalist or Republican communities uh, perception that police officers were, go back to your issue about collateral damage or worthy or unworthy victims, that they would have a view of that which differs. We're not really there yet. I, I think probably it would be unrealistic to expect in two decades for us mm. to be there. Mm. I think probably a political solution being reached is important, but it's not the end point. We still have a way to go. Moving on to the 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 the, the series, the sort of secret history series that was on um, towards the end of last year, it was quite an interesting um, 
series of things. I mean, I particularly like the behind the scenes uh, one at the end, which kind of wrapped it all up. And you saw maybe how long uh, the kind of researchers, I mean, for two years, I think it was, the amount of effort that goes in. But for me particularly, it was the amount of documentary media you know, the items, if you like, you know, the reports that were found or, you know, reports were lost, mysteriously lost or destroyed in, in, in fires and all that sort of stuff. But then someone else had kept a copy. Um, and so really, this kind of, the role of documentation in its broadest sense, whether that's, you know, photography or film or in this case, sort of, you know, actual documents plays such a vital role. Because, like you said, if you're not ready to move into reconciliation, two decades after the so-called peace, if it takes another 30 or 40 or 50 years, then it's only that kind of thing that's going to reflect back on maybe who we thought was the hero is in fact the villain and who we thought the villain was was in fact um, the hero. I mean, what, what, what's, your, what's your view on that as, as an academic when it comes to trying to do research and stuff? I think you're right. I mean, there, there are a lot of public records um, which are in existence. And I think we talked about this before previously, uh, Every Christmas in, the, in all the local newspapers in Northern Ireland, there will be revelations which is the 30 year release of documents. But it's also fair to say a lot of documents have went missing in circumstances which would certainly seem suspicious. I think we're probably not seeing the full extent of a lot of the documentation that may have existed, which perhaps uh, referred to um, again the, the British intelligence operations in Northern Ireland, the infiltration of loyalist and republican paramilitaries. I mean, these are these are questions which I think the documentary series you're referring to. Um, a lot of the stuff there wasn't perhaps new. I mean, a lot of academics who had studied um, loyalist paramilitarism, for example, um, did comment on it. It wasn't really earth shattering, but it was presented as if it was a new scoop. Uh, I think. Can I, can I just interrupt you? Do, do you think it would have been? Do you think it would have been seen as a revelation to your average member of the public? Probably not, if yeah. I'm being honest. I think for a lot of people in Northern Ireland, there would be, a bit, again, depending on your community perspective, hmm. you maybe had evidence confirming what you probably suspected. Okay. And in many cases, uh, that probably isn't changing a mindset or changing an opinion. So I think for a lot of people, I mean, some of the major revelations, thinking of them in my lifetime, that we've, we've learned about, I mean, certainly the rhetoric of the Thatcher government about you know not negotiating with terrorists, having a very hard line on it, particularly after the eighty-one hunger strikes, and then around the mid nineties, we have lots of evidence that there were back channels and that they were doing what they said publicly they would vehemently were opposed to. I think there are issues like that where I think at that time we're seeing a shock, and I don't think now, given the sort of drip feed of revelations, and that documentary series did point to a few. Um, I, I'm not really surprised. I don't think many people would be living in Northern Ireland about some of the revelations, particularly about these linkages between some paramilitaries and, and the British intelligence operation there, which I think there, there's an awful lot of evidence for really two decades worth of evidence about how uh, murky it was. Again, how some decisions taken um, in London determined whether people were sacrificed or not. And, mm. and raising questions again about the, the British uh, state's decision making around regarding North Ireland. So I'm not really that surprised. I don't think many people would be that shocked. But over here, that's more interesting to me because I think over here there's a gap. A lot of people here probably, going back to the media coverage question, didn't really know about some of the things that are being discussed in that series. So I think it is a value in that and perhaps telling people in mainland Britain this was going on and you weren't really aware of large aspects of it. Hmm. I think that's where the whole kind of racism thing comes in quite interesting as well, having that conversation about sort of, uh, you know, being Irish and the way Irish people were treated in the 70s during during the troubles here in the UK and in London. Um, I know, particularly speaking to, you know, a few people here in, in the Leicester Irish community who said at that time there was quite a lot of hostility towards them. Um, and obviously things like, you know, had an Irishman try to buy your van for five hundred pound cash? You know, ring up this telephone line. You know what I mean? It's a, and again, it's it's kind of hate speech to an extent. When you kind of take one step back and take yourself out of that situation, you start thinking about the way that um, the messages that came out, uh, the way that people were portrayed, and who to look out for, and all that kind of stuff. It kind of really makes it makes it quite interesting. It's all the ring, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we'll talk about this in the next 24 hours in lots of different areas. It, it's sort of, 
uh, dehumanization, both sex treating people as different or others. And, and I think you're right. I, mean, I went to university in the late 1990s. Um, you can work at my age from that roughly, so apologies in advance. <laughs> but one of the things that got me traveling to Scotland, where I went to university, was I mean, at that time we were we were in a peace. I mean, again, this was sort of before the 1998 agreement, but even then there were still the separate queues to, to try to, to travel to Belfast. Yeah. Um, even now, and in some airports, there is they still use the same infrastructure. So if you're flying to Northern Ireland, you're taken away somewhere different. I mean, that's sort of re representing an idea that, that people from Northern Ireland were a threat. Um, and again, you're right, those sort of stereotypes, I think, that comes back to the media coverage. And, and if you think about the, the major miscarriages of justice, uh, you know, Guildford 4, Birmingham 6, I mean, if you look at the media coverage then, you know, there were people in, in respectable journalists from from high profile, <clears throat> uh, not just tabloid, but also broadsheet press, calling for the death penalty. Mm. You know, and mm. again, the evidence uh, at that time, the way in which the, the British media were basically, you know, forced to push this line, mm. um, now it looks quite shocking. But that's the benefit of hindsight, I think, and the benefit of what we know as a result of you know those revelations that we've had over several decades. Mm. So I think you're right. There is a, there's a degree of that, and perhaps to a certain extent, those stereotypes types do continue thinking about Brexit and the way that's been framed certainly in some of some of the tabloid press there are still remnants of that in terms of you know not trusting hmm. Ireland to, to act honourably in terms of that so I think you're right. Do you think there's a role as well with something like Instagram um, with that hashtag of the troubles coming back to that project that sort of in 10 years 20 years 30 years time that that, that actually might be seen as something that's kind of open source free um, non-filtered, unbiased, actually probably is seen as honest dialogue around the troubles and remembrance and, and the role of memory around some of these events than some of the official narratives and books that you will look back at and think, well, actually, that was written with a heavy degree of sympathy or you know, empathy towards one side or the other. You'd hope so. I mean, I, I think, again, it depends on the, the person who's sharing the image and why. In many cases, um, I mean, we've talked about this um, before. I mean, I think the, the most partisan, hostile exchanges in terms of comments, and again, what people think when they don't comment is a different matter, uh, tend to be British you know, personnel, you know, British squaddies talking about their experience. And I think that's probably um, to be expected. I think to a certain extent, people who would look for the troubles hashtag on instagram uh, may do so for a very politicized reason and to a certain extent you know a picture of uh, in many cases a uh, british military land rover or helicopter uh, will generate the odd you know trolling comments and, and somebody being quite negative but on the flip side of that you also have um, people who shared that experience actually talking about it from a very personal viewpoint which was i mean in one case which was very um, stark for me it was a picture of, of um, three British soldiers in a barracks in South Armagh, and the, the commentary on the, the caption actually pointed out who they were, so they were named, which again, not always the case. And, uh, and below it, somebody said, I actually served that officer, and they died two weeks after this was taken in an mm. IRA murder attack. <clears throat> and, and a thing like that where it was people actually almost coming together around the image or interest. And I think to a certain extent, Instagram maybe. In this area, it doesn't have the connections that it would have in less political or controversial terms. And I suppose to an extent, I always wonder, the people who view it and don't like it, don't comment on it, you know, mm. what do they think? Mm. It's not likely to change an opinion, mm. but it may well give you know, a human face to things that perhaps people had a very negative or stereotypical view of. Mm. So, yeah, but it's democratising it to an extent and democratising mm. the documentation of it. I suppose also it's the role of imagery, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can look at an image and it says one thing to you. Um, I was interesting, wasn't it? The five that I picked that I spoke to you about, um, sort of, there was the, the, the one from very early on in the Troubles with like, you know, British soldiers, you could tell by their equipment and their helmets. It was in the very early days when it was a like barbed wire and it obviously just arrived. Um, and it was very much like East Germany when the wall first went up and the, image, the iconic image of the guy jumping over the wire. And then there was the two soldiers walking along, one sort of looking like he was the pin-up poster boy for the British Army in, in the 1990s, and the other one with a look on his face which 
put him in a different completely set of set of dress and it would have been Saturday down at the terraces kind of angry ready for a fight walking down the road together it's just kind of juncture position uh, of what it was and obviously the young girl as well standing you know looking quite smart obviously either on her way to work or college or wherever um, standing in the middle of all of this rubble and it could be Sarajevo it could be Syria it could be Yemen it could be any of those things and I suppose it's it's the value of the of the image then isn't it but it's how it's presented what the narrative is will then date it and time it and maybe also say where the person is from an empathy point of view I think yeah we talked about it before I think it, it, what's interesting to me is yeah the barbed wire <laughs> picture when we were talking about it I actually went back to that and we uh, having been to Berlin we saw the, the imagery there in terms of the wall memorial and the museum it, do, it does remind me of that and also there's a kind of um, a comparison there I think in terms of in the start of the troubles there weren't peace walls and it was barbed wire across the streets mm. and the British army personnel will have to share the images obviously on the, on the page if we haven't done so already um, are not in full you know gear you know that they're, they're almost like I mean they're engaging with the population mm. it doesn't seem a very contentious issue which of course uh, perhaps the tragedy of what happened in 68 69 was that at the time the British army were welcomed by you know Catholic nationalists and Republicans at that time because they were seen as protective because again they were there to do a job to restore order and then you have this sort of move I think towards the securitization towards you know, formidable peace walls across Belfast rather than the barbed wire. And mm. you write that imagery about Berlin mm. and that soldier jumping over it. Mm. I think there's a comparison there, which mm. is interesting mm. because it's black and white. Yeah. And I think black and white images, particularly for combat ones, can be um, perhaps um, more provocative than the coloured ones in mm. terms of images from 68 to 72. Uh, some of the ones that we were talking about the other day, the black and white ones are very powerful images um, and I very... Thought, yeah. I think it's often things in the background which are as interesting as mm. things in the foreground. That soldier with the, the, the facial expression you're referring mm. to, um, again, someone look at that might just look at the poster boy. And I think that's, that's interesting thinking about that's the image that they want you to see if you're mm. a British Army um, recruiter. But that image in the background of someone perhaps giving away how he feels about being mm. there, about mm. being in that situation. And the girl in the dress, I, I think you're right, it, it could be anywhere. At that time, and there were a lot of protests across Europe in 68, 69, or in that time. Um, it's only really when you look at the hashtag and perhaps look at the background that you would mm. actually say, Well, that's in, yeah. in Derry. You know, yeah. you'd actually work out where it was. Yeah. But it's interesting, sort of themes which are universal. Yeah. And you've got, you've got black and white as well. For me, it tends to mean sort of, you know, meaning. When you look at a black and white photo, it makes you look for the meaning. Whereas when it's in colour, it, it gives you a feeling. You know what I mean? It's slightly different. You know what I mean? And it's very, it's very difficult. Um, you know, I think that's why you almost have to go for the shock value of a colour photograph when it comes to the level of violence. Whereas, in fact, with a black and white photo, it can actually be just implied, or you know, it's on the edge of something happening. You know, what happened next? And I suppose that's really what we miss in the whole photojournalism side of things, like the days of Don McCullen with um, you know seven or eight page spreads in in Sunday in Sunday broadsheets uh, magazines is the fact that we, we're missing out on the meaning because we're getting a photo that you're meant to draw uh, an instant uh, opinion about. I always wonder, I mean, his, um, I, I mean, his book and his discussion of this, I've seen some interviews with him. I, I'm always intrigued to move more fashion photojournalists as to them interpreting their images years later. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in his case, it was a book that was out a year or two ago so he's looking back over a long career a long time and now thinking about what those images meant not just in the moment when he captured them but also how he interprets them and i get i get a sense that from some of the, the stuff i've read certainly that people like him um thought that they were they were documenting something which was important which needed to be seen but for whatever reason it wasn't seen because news media organizations didn't use the images they would have wanted them to they used images which, I mean, sometimes it can be stereotypical images. So a lot of people's view of Belfast, I think certainly in mainland Britain, and even in the mid-1990s, was 1972. You know, and a lot of people perhaps still now have a stereotypical view of of Belfast geography, um, about how prevalent things like peace walls are, how, you know, how, how divided it is. And again, it is still divided. I mean, there are large parts of Belfast which are as divided now as they were then in terms of peace walls and these infrastructures 
but it's clearly different. And I think yeah, you're right, it's about stereotyping and about maybe photojournalism having a duty to obviously tell a story, but also to leave the space for the person looking mm. at the image to mm. make their own interpretation mm. and perhaps to draw things from it which aren't immediately obvious. Mm. And the picture that you shared with me with the, the wreckage of the aftermath of a bomb attack in Derry with the rally in the front is a really good example of that. Mm, mm. I mean, we were talking about that before. I'm sure you, you'll, you'll say something about it in a second. The juxtaposition of a, a political rally almost yeah. with the aftermath of a, of a, a mm. van that had been bombed, that had been mm, driven into mm. um, a shop. Um, trying to work that out. And again, I think one of the comments that we looked at was someone saying, can someone tell me where this was and mm. when? Mm. And there's no response, which yeah. I think is interesting in terms of on Instagram, somebody 50 years later yeah. trying to work out what had went on, what the context was and what it meant and not getting an answer, which is quite interesting too. Yeah, it reminded me of some of the images I've seen from sort of Syria and other conflicts in the Middle East where a lot of people say, oh, this is Photoshopped because it's just, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's too neat. It's too it's too perfect. It's got all the elements in it. It's got, you know, fire and rage in the background and then someone on a microphone roaring the, roaring the crowd up and would you be that close to a fire? Um, and it's really interesting that how images are used in order to make a statement or almost to turn around and say to you this is what happened whereas in fact you know the best images are the ones that invite you to sort of you know investigate more or find out what's more anyway we've come to the end of this section okay so i'm going to come back to you at eight o'clock and we'll do a next facebook live i want to talk to you a little bit about education and you don't know why so that's why i'm going to catch you out (laughs) <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to try and catch you out. I'll give you 20 minutes to go and get a coffee and then we're going to think a little bit about um, you know, what kind of question am I going to ask you about education. All right. Not university education, school education. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Proper education. Proper education. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. Sure.